Altesse, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais tout d'abord vous remercier pour l'opportunité de prononcer cette conférence annuelle au Centre mondial du pluralisme. C'est un véritable plaisir et un privilège. Et je tiens également à remercier la délégation de l'imamat Ismaili pour son accueil et son hospitalité. Today, all societies are, are on their way to become multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious. And for some, this is a source of discomfort and unease. In many societies, populist politicians playing upon fears to obtain mindless votes, and the irresponsible media only interested in market shares and infotainment, manipulate feelings of anxiety, fear and insecurity, creating artificial divisions, disrupting social cohesion, and in extreme cases, provoking persecution and conflict. We can see these even in my part of the world, in Europe, where fueled by the economic crisis and high levels of unemployment, anti-immigration and xenophobic parties are gaining influence, as we have seen recently in the European elections. And mainstream parties are unable, or sometimes even unwilling, to oppose these effectively. I always try to convince my friends in mainstream parties that it's totally useless to try to imitate a radical party on xenophobia, because if people have to vote, they prefer to vote to an, in an original than in an imitation. But it's not always easy to convince them of that. Xenophobia, racism, Islamophobia, or the invocation of false identities diminish us all. Not only are they unable to ease the fears of what is new and unfamiliar, but they tend to exacerbate them. And the reality is that uh, with an average fertility rate of 1.5 children per woman, Europe needs immigration to sustain its economy and to pay the pensions of its aging population. But this is a largely unrecognized truth. Recently, I saw the results of an opinion poll where people were asked three questions. Do you want to end with more children? The majority said no. Are you willing to do menial work? Again, the response was no. Would you favor more immigration? And again, people said no. Now, this is an impossible discourse, an equation without solution. Immigration is not part of the problem of modern societies, it is the part of solution, and nobody can prove it better than Canada. Without immigration, many of our communities, namely in Europe, would become completely unsustainable. In other parts of the world, where state structures are weak or non-existent, and where respect for diversity is destroyed by ambition or corruption, the incapacity to identify common qualities the lack of empathy with the other and the manipulation of fears by unscrupulous politicians can have even more tragic consequences. When I returned from a visit from the Central African Republic earlier this year, I had the opportunity to tell the Security Council that I did not remember a field trip in my year, nine-year tenure as High Commissioner for Refugees that had caused me so much anguish as that one. I was shocked by the brutality and the inhumanity of the violence, targeting women, men and even children only because they were Muslims. But my subsequent mission to South Sudan was equally distressing. In Gambela, Ethiopia, I saw tens of thousands of women and children seeking refuge from atrocity. And many of the children were severely malnourished and their mothers told me the horrors of the violence unleashed in their communities. Until last year, the Central African Republic was largely a stranger to religious violence, which is why it is wrong to characterize the current situation as a religious conflict. Despite the widespread corruption and poverty, banditry and violence, Christians and Muslims had always lived side by side in CAR. 
religious hatred was one of the few problems that Central African Republicans did not have. But state structures had largely disintegrated and banditry was rife when the Seleka seized power in late 2012. The Seleka was an alliance of Central African rebel groups and foreign fighters and was indeed predominantly Muslim, but they had not an Islamic State as part of their agenda. Simply, the widespread looting and killings committed by the Seleka and ex-Seleka members led to the emergence of the so-called anti-Balaka, a combination of vigilante groups and bandits. While they called themselves Christian self-defense militias, they soon turned into an uncontrollable, uncontrollable monster. And they gave rise to a sectarian divide, mostly along religious lines, that is now tearing apart the social fabric of that country. In South Sudan, the rift is not along religious, but ethnic lines. At its independence, the leaders of South Sudan were faced with daunting challenges. This was one of the most underdeveloped places in the world, and as a result of decades of war and neglect. As aid and money poured in, corruption, ethnic nepotism, and competition over power and resources grew. All disputes re-emerged, and the country's leaders, all former rebels, were quick to come up with a military answer to political problems. A political squabble turned into an ethnic conflict when antagonistic leaders rallied support along ethnic lines. Sunnuers were fighting Dinka on a larger scale than ever before, deliberately targeting civilians and turning against moderate voices within their own communities. While a religious or an ethnic conflict usually starts out with face or ethnicity being instrumentalized for political purposes, the real danger is that these tensions then gain a dynamic of their own, a genie that once it is out of the bottle becomes exceedingly difficult to control, let alone to put back. But let's not forget the origin of the conflict was not religious in Central African Republic, was not ethnic in South Sudan, it was strictly political. And it was the intentions of politicians that turned what has always been a religious tolerant society and a multi-ethnic community that lived more or less together without major problems into two dramatic civil wars. It is against these realities that the voice of tolerance and reason and the values of pluralism need to rise. Diversity is not a threat. Diversity represents the richness of our communities. And we must stand together against all forms of irrationality and manipulation that lead to hatred, be it political populism, radical nationalism, or religious fundamentalism. Ladies and gentlemen, globalization that brought many positive things to today's world has also been unfair. Its benefits have been distributed unequally and many have been left out. And the paradox of today's world is that money moves freely, goods and services tend to move relatively freely, but people cannot. People are stopped by physical and legal barriers. And one of the things I have learned in my years of public life is that markets work. As you might know, I, um, I was a member before I now have to be strictly non-political of a socialist party. But I understood that markets work. And supply and demand tend to meet. And in the global labor market, supply and demand will also meet, legally if possible, illegally if necessary. Despite barriers, Millions of people move from one country to another in the hope of a better future, and millions of others move to save their lives. They often travel alongside each other, creating the so-called asylum migration nexus. And when international migration is managed by border controls only, in an effort to keep people out, human traffickers and smugglers are bound to prosper. And there is something fundamentally wrong in a world where people have to risk their lives to seek safety and where at the end of a dangerous journey they are not welcome or even turned away. 
It breaks my heart to see Syrian refugees today being pushed back at the Bulgarian border, or let's not forget that this is one of the European Union external borders, or drawn in the Mediterranean, as they have no other ways to find asylum. We need more international cooperation between countries of origin, transit and destination, and concerted efforts to identify opportunities for legal migration. And we also need international trade and globalization to become true agents of development, more targeted development programs focused on poverty reduction, job creation, and the strengthening of governance, rule of law, and public services. The problems of governance or lack of governments and corruption are behind many of the dramatic crises we face in today's world and many of the most tragic forms of forced displacement that we have to deal with. And greater efforts should be made to address the challenges of conflict prevention, conflict resolution and peace building, so that when people move, they do so out of choice, not out of necessity. Irrespective of cultural, religious or ethnic differences, men and women around the world share a common humanity. Aristotle was among the first to deny that division was the necessary outcome of diversity. And this concept has been followed through by many illustrious thinkers up to today, seeking to identify the qualities and experiences that unite rather than divide people Pluralism can be a powerful force that foster more harmonious, peaceful, and prosperous societies. A common value that can be found in all cultures is the idea of giving protection and of sheltering a stranger in need, a refugee. The word asylum is derived from the Greek word asylon, or sanctuary, a designated space in each city of a temple where people could find safety. Flight from persecution and the search for a protected space are central themes in all three Abrahamic faiths and can also be found in Hindu mythology, mythology and Buddhist teachings. The exodus of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt is a central story in the Jewish faith. In Christianity, the, fight of the flight of the Holy Family from Bethlehem is studied by all children. And for Muslims, the Islamic calendar starts with the year that the Prophet, peace be upon him, traveled to Medina to seek protection as he and his followers had come under threat. When some of the first Muslims suffered persecution in Mecca, they were given asylum by the Christian emperor of Abyssinia, who withstood great pressure and declined precious gifts, refusing to return the refugees to their persecutors. Similarly, in the early Middle East, Jews from many parts of Europe found sanctuary in Al-Andalus, where they were allowed to practice their religion and had opportunities to work and trade. And in particular, there is nothing in modern refugee law that was not already explicitly contained in Islamic law and Islamic traditions since the very beginning. It was only after the horrors of World War II that the protection of refugees became an obligation and an international law. The 51 Refugee Convention establishes who is a refugee and what their rights and responsibilities are. It also spells out the obligations that states have towards the people seeking safety on their soil. non refoulement or the no return of people in need of asylum is the cornerstone of the refugee regime. But this was not discovered by the Western world and not discovered by, uh, the, after the Second World War. This was enshrined in the values cultural and religious values of many civilizations around the world since the very beginning. And after that, building on these, the African Refugee Convention was adopted in 69, and the Declaration of Cartagena about refugees in 1984 to respond to specific regional dimensions of forced displacement in Africa and Latin America, and in both cases with more generous regimes of refugee recognition than the 51 Convention. UNHCR was created by the UN General Assembly to lead and coordinate international action for the worldwide protection of refugees and to find solutions for them. And to fulfill this mandate, my office works together with a wide range of partners, including the Aga Khan Development Network. We have an excellent partnership with many of the network's agencies, including in Central Asia, the Middle East, and East Africa. And for that, I am extremely grateful to Your Highness. 
While initially focusing on Europe, by the time Prince Sadruddin Hagahan was elected High Commissioner in 1965, UNHCR became operational in much of the developed world. But Prince Sadruddin Hagahan is still remembered with admiration as the man who steered the organization through some of the most challenging humanitarian crises of that time. And he also played, as Your Highness remembered, a key role in finding new homes, including here in Canada, for tens of thousands of South Asians who have been expelled overnight from Uganda in 1972. Today, an unprecedented number of people are uprooted by violence and persecution. One of the most dramatic situations in, is Syria, which saw more than three million of its citizens flee the country in little more than three years. Only five years ago, Syria was the world's second largest refugee hosting country, and now Syrians are the largest group of refugees worldwide, followed by Afghans and Somalis. The overwhelming majority of Syrian refugees found safety in the neighboring countries, where communities are showing a generosity that is well beyond their means. UNHCR recently registered the million Syrian refugee arriving in Lebanon. With 244 registered Syrian refugees for every 1,000 Lebanese, Lebanon already has the highest concentration of refugees than any other country in recent history. This is 20, 295 times as many refugees per capita as in the United States, and nearly 52 times as many as in Canada. In Lebanon, as in most refugee hosting countries around the world, the strain that the large presence of refugees places on services and resources has become unbearable. The world needs to do much more to support Syria's neighbors, recognizing that this conflict has become a major threat to regional security. And let's not forget that contrary to the populist mantra that all asylum seekers are on their way to the industrialized world, 86% of the world's refugees live in developing countries compared with 70% a decade ago. Rather than seeing refugees as competitors and a burden, their presence can be an incentive to advance poor areas. And we need to promote the development of refugee hosting areas involving refugees and local communities, rather than just handing out assistance to the refugees year after year. Stimulating self-reliance, education, and livelihood opportunities for refugees and those communities are key to fostering more harmonious relations and a better protection environment. Instead of competing over scarce resources, host communities and refugees can work together to improve their future. I am convinced that this will ultimately help them to, to stop the flow of desperate people who move on out of necessity. Ladies and gentlemen, Canada has a proud history of welcoming refugees. Loyalists, freemen and slaves fleeing the American Revolution in the 18th century. Europeans leaving behind oppression, persecution and authoritarian states in the 19th and 20th centuries. Latin Americans escaping military regimes and growing number of refugees from other parts of the world found sanctuary in Canada. Canada's resettlement program is one of the largest in the world and it offers refugees who can no longer stay in their first country of asylum an opportunity to rebuild their lives. Resettlement is also a practical way of sharing the burden of developing countries that host large refugee populations. And I welcome all efforts to maintain and strengthen a global and flexible resettlement program and encourage Canada to resettle a larger number of refugees from Syria at the present moment. My country, Portugal, has seen many of its people leave. Some because of oppression during 48 years of dictatorship that ended with the Carnation Revolution of 74, others because of economic hardship. When I was in government, we commissioned a study to find out how well these people had integrated and how they perceived their new countries. And the study found that the Portuguese community in Canada felt more integrated and better accepted than any of the others in the world. The best image of their country uh, of uh, residence for the Portuguese communities in the world, the best image was the image of Canada for the Portuguese living in Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Canada is indeed a clear demonstration that multicultural, multi-ethnical and multi-religious societies are not only inevitable, that they are a good thing. Diversity and pluralism enrich societies and should be cherished by good governance, strong civic institutions and policies that promote and respect diversity. The recognition of our common humanity, inclusion and solidarity, tolerance and compromise are key elements of strong, cohesive and peaceful societies. The mission of the Global Centre for Pluralism is to advance global understanding of pluralism as an ethic of respect that values diversity and to enable each and every person to realise his or her full potential as a citizen. I wish you every success in this important undertaking. Merci bien à vous tous.